Over my 20 year career as a professional restaurant chef, I've certainly cooked a burger or two or 10,000 probably. And along that journey, I've certainly picked up a few tips that I would love to share with you today. And hopefully by the end of this video, you are feeling more inspired than ever to apply these tips to your own cooking journey. I hope you come out of this video feeling like an absolute burger genius. And as always, I'm bald and there's no time to waste. Now let's go. Tip number one is to buy beef that just has a really good fat content. And for me, I'm almost always going 80-20, meaning 20% fat. If you want, you could probably get away with using 15% fat instead of 20, but anything lower than that, it's just gonna be too prone to drying out in the pan. The second tip, and this is definitely my preferred way of making a burger, it's gonna be to grind your own beef. You absolutely don't need to do this, but as your cooking journey progresses, it is something I want you to start thinking about. And honestly, this is my preferred way to make a burger. I'll literally just go to the supermarket and see what looks good Good that day to me. Sometimes there's things on sale and honestly, I'll just try whatever. Today, I'm gonna do a blend of tri-tip, chuck roast, and top sirloin. So two fatty cuts and one cut that's a little bit leaner. And just by looking at it, I can say it's probably gonna be about 25% fat, maybe a little more, which I am not against. Because remember, as you cook this in the pan, all that fat is gonna render out. A lot of it is gonna be gone. And then the burger is sort of shallow frying in its own fat, which is a beautiful thing. You can grind up any cut of meat you want, although I would never really do it to a ribeye or a New York strip or a beef tenderloin. They're just too expensive and nice to grind up. Here's a list of grind worthy cuts that you can try out. Experiment with different combinations and see what you like. I can also say you definitely don't need to buy three different cuts of meat just to make ground beef. If you're looking for one cheap cut that will have the right amount of fat content, I would honestly just go for chuck roast. Prior to grinding, all we need to do is slice up our beef into pieces about this size. And I always just try to follow the seam here where the meat naturally wants to split. I like my ground beef fatty, but if you want, you could also trim away more more fat, because as you can see, that chuck roast has got a lot marbled into it. However, I'm going chefy, so I'm leaving the fat on. And with my tri-tip here, I can see it has a lot of this sort of chewy fat. I can just feel that type of fat that is, which is much different than this type of fat you see over here on the chuck roast. So we'll just get under here and just start trimming away. This fat underneath is good, it's just that stuff. No bueno. Here's all my meat done. You wanna keep that cold before you grind it. I cut it up pretty quick. It's all still really cold, but if for some reason you take a long time to do this, definitely pop it in the freezer for like 10 minutes, just so it's cold before it goes through the grinder, which is the next step. I'm using a KitchenAid attachment meat grinder and I throw it in the freezer for about 25 minutes prior to use because when you're grinding meat, you want everything to stay really cold. Simply just run all your cuts of beef through the meat grinder into a big bowl like this. Sometimes people will now even put a finer setting on the meat grinder and run all your meat through again. And that can be really good if you're making something like a smash burger. However, for regular burgers, I usually just go through once it seems to be enough for me. On a side note here, if your metal bowl will fit into the freezer prior to grinding your meat, that's also a good way to keep it cold. And here, I'm just giving it a gentle mix. I don't wanna actually smash it into oblivion right now until I form my burger patty. It can be good to leave a little structure to that beef. Of course, for burgers only, if you're making sausages or something, it's a different story, right? But for now, I'm gonna leave it just about like this. From here, I'm gonna add my beef into these vacuum seal bags, but fear not, I know a lot of people don't have vacuum sealers, just use a gallon Ziploc bag, and just try to get out as much air as possible. But a while back, I fulfilled my lifelong dream of owning a chamber vacuum sealer, something that you would only find in a professional restaurant. And it's completely and totally unnecessary to have one of these in your home, but it puts a big old grin on my face, I just love having one. And there's my beef, I'm gonna go ahead and freeze this now. For future use, I just saved about a pound of ground beef for the burgers today. At this point, I'm gonna just work my beef a little bit, not too much. I just wanna bring it together. That looks nice. And then I'll take a little square piece of parchment paper, set that down in there. I just cut a big piece of parchment paper into squares. Another one goes on top. Take my handy dandy little smasher here. If you don't have one of these, you can just use a small side plate, that will work. Smash it down. And that actually leads me right to, the third tip is for forming your beef patty. And this is important because you wanna make it bigger than the bun. And how I do this is I just take the burger bun that I'm using today, I hold it right above the burger and I look from the top down. Birds view and I want to make sure that the burger itself is about an inch or even a little over an inch around the circumference of the bun. And so I need to smash it down a little bit more because when you're cooking any protein, it's going to shrink a lot in the pan. So this is really important. Let's measure again. That looks good to me. It may seem like it's too huge to you, but trust me, you're going to see by the end of this video that was perfectly measured. And the fourth tip is also about forming your patty because you really need to dimple that middle. This is another super important tip when you're making a burger patty. And if you don't do this, you're going to end up with 
with a meatball inside of your burger bun. Nobody should have to earn their way to the beef by biting through a bunch of dried bread. Like it just doesn't make sense, right? This is such an important tip to make sure your burger ends up flat when it's done. Gotta account for shrinkage. I know obviously this may seem like an absolutely massive burger to you, but it is because I have a massive bun, right? You always just need to measure your beef to your bun. The fifth tip is about disarming your onions because just straight raw onions can be a little bit harsh. I'm gonna use a little red onion today. You can use whatever. Take the bottom and a tiny bit off the top, just like that. From here, I'll peel. And then I'm gonna slice it into thin rounds like this. Not too thick, not too thin. Now here's the trick. You just take some ice water, throw your onions in there, let them sit in here for 15 minutes, and you can say goodbye to that real harsh, acidic, oniony taste that's gonna leave you with dragon's breath. And also because that water is ice cold, it's gonna make them even more crispy and crunchy. So it's a two-in-one situation. On another note today, I'm just doing a standard burger, but one of my favorite onion preparations for a burger is sauteed onions or caramelized onions, depending on what you like. Just know you can do whatever you want with the onion. This is just a trick for raw onions. It's been 15 minutes. Let's taste one of these onions, huh? Mmm, mmm. It just has the right amount of harsh onionness, And the crunch it got from the ice water is also fantastic. At this point, I'm gonna get them out onto some paper towel just to dry them off. The sixth tip is a simple one, but it's really about choosing the right lettuce to set your burger apart. Which is why I always spend a little more money to choose a really crunchy, beautiful piece of butter lettuce. I'll just take off that little root end down there. I'll just take a few pieces for the burger today. And there you have it, my friends. That is the best lettuce for a burger. Simple, but effective. The seventh tip is a no-brainer, and I hope most of you are doing this one already, but it's about seasoning your tomatoes and when to do it. Let's take our tomato here, take off that little end piece, make the slices not too thick, not too thin. If they're too thick, they tend to slide around too much on the burger, and if they're too thin, you won't even really notice them, right? So get that thickness right. Something like this looks pretty good to me. I'll then just lay these out on a plate and I don't wanna season them right now. I wanna season them right before I put them on the burger. You can season them early, but they tend to break down and get a little bit mushy by the time you need them. So I like to do it right before serving. The eighth tip, and I'm gonna keep hammering this point home to people because nobody seems to wanna do this. But on this channel, I'm going to tell you the truth that making your own mayonnaise will absolutely set your burger apart from the pack. And not just burger, this goes for sandwiches as well. Don't feel like you can't make this burger if you don't make your mayonnaise, but I really wanna encourage you if you're new to cook if you love cooking, making your own mayonnaise should be high up on your list. I'm gonna use a food processor today. You could try using a blender if you want. Some of them work and some of them don't, so it's kind of a gamble. Most of the time you can get away with it. I'm cracking one whole egg, garlic, and water. Exact measurements will be in the description. Now at this point, I'm gonna put the lid on and blend it for one minute. This process is super important, starting with the eggs, water, and garlic to make a fluffy mayonnaise. And you can see here just after 30 seconds, it's starting to get a lot of air inside and it's getting all white and fluffy and beautiful. There we are, after a minute, I'm gonna add my lemon juice, white wine or white vinegar, vinegar and salt. Blend for another 20 seconds and then slowly start streaming in your avocado oil, which is my preferred oil for making mayonnaise because of the neutral flavor and the fact that it is a good one for your body. Once all your avocado oil is worked in, I'll return to blending and I'll just add two more tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil. You wanna add this last because if you add it too early and you add too much, your mayonnaise tends to get really bitter and I don't want it to be that bitter at all. And there's your mayonnaise done. I try to use this one up within five days, which actually isn't hard to do because it's so good, we always finish it sooner. Also, if you're freaked out about raw eggs, I'll put a link down in the description to a video where I used poached eggs, another amazing mayonnaise. The ninth tip is about using clarified butter to toast your bun. It really is the premier method. I'll just start by throwing a bunch of cold unsalted butter into a little pot over low heat. This is so freaking easy to make, but essentially what we're gonna do is remove all the cream left over from the butter making process. Cream makes butter. And when we're done, we'll be able to use this for high heat cooking. It's like the most tasty high heat cooking fat you can make really. So just let it melt. And after a few minutes, that cream will have risen to the top and I like to just scoop it off using a slotted spoon. Although you can absolutely just use a regular spoon for this as well, the slotted spoon just really helps out. After a few minutes of skimming, just dump out your liquid gold. You'll also tend to see a little bit of that cream residue left at the bottom of the pot as well. Just do your best to try and not pour that off along with the liquid gold, AKA the butter. And the 10th tip, which is kind of a bonus tip here, is to always keep fat and acid in mind when you're building a burger. What do I mean by that? Okay, so you have a burger. It's got some fatty meat, some fatty cheese. The bun is toasted in fatty butter, right? Fat, fat 
fat, fat. What makes a burger so good? Why are they so popular here in America and abroad? It's because to balance out all that fat, you have the mayonnaise, which has the vinegar and the lemon, the acidic element. You have the tomatoes, which are acidic. You have pickles, which are acidic. So every time you take a bite, you're getting this balanced experience of fat and acid. That's what makes them so desirable. So always keep fat and acid in mind when you're designing a burger and not just that, keep it in mind when you're cooking anything. Dipping french fries into ketchup is fat and acid. Squeezing lime into avocados to make guacamole is fat and acid. Putting wine in a cream sauce is fat and acid. It is everywhere and it is so important to cooking. Don't forget it. When it comes to seasoning the burger, I'm always just doing it right before I cook it. Just a little bit of salt and pepper on each side. I'm gonna slightly press it into the burger as well so I know it sticks. Today I'll be cooking these burgers on Made In Cookware's Carbon Steel Griddle, which I'm very proud to say is the sponsor of this video. And trust me when I say it was an easy sponsor to take because I've been using Made In's products long before they ever sponsored any of my videos. And I love what Made In Cookware is doing because they're designing professional quality products for the home cook. And personally, through my 20 years as a professional restaurant chef, I certainly look up to two and three Michelin star chefs, which is why I personally take comfort that the restaurant in Chicago called Alinea uses these pans. And not only that, New York's La Bernardine uses them as well. If two of the world's best chefs put their trust in these pans, so do I. They partner with multi-generational factories and artisans to help bring you a curated collection of materials and shapes that you need in the kitchen. And today we're talking about their carbon steel line, which is one of my personal favorites for cookware. The made in griddle can handle temperatures up to 1,200 Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit, all while remaining naturally non-stick. With hand welded wedges and raised handles for an ergonomic carry, this piece is perfect for cooking on the stove, out on the grill, or even on an open flame. It's large enough to easily cover two burners, and it has specifically designed sloped edges so it can hold 40 ounces of liquid. I'm using it today for burgers, but this beast of a griddle would be perfect for making breakfast. You wanna throw some bacon on there, some pancakes, some sausage patties, some hash browns, it can fit it all. There's a good reason that carbon steel cookware is loved by chefs all around the world. It's literally half half the weight of cast iron and just as durable. It seasons faster, it heats up quicker, and it's super portable if you wanna take it from inside on the stove to outside on the grill. You can check out the Carbon Steel Griddle and Maiden's other cookware by clicking the link down in the description. Thank you Maiden for sponsoring this video and now let's go finish these burgers. I put my Maiden griddle over two burners and had one full blast for the burger and the burner on the back end I put on low heat for the bun soon to come. Once my griddle preheated after about four or five minutes, I put on a tiny bit of oil. You really don't need much at all because the burger is full of fat, but a little bit just starts to help the process. I dropped my burger down and cooked it for about three minutes on the first side before flipping and then adding the cheese immediately. Because after three minutes of cooking on the other side, the heat from the burger had actually melted the cheese. I took my burger off and then applied a bunch of clarified butter to that cooler end of the griddle. Whenever I'm toasting brioche buns like this, I always start by rolling them around a bit in the butter to make sure it gets in all the nooks and crannies. And a lot of times I see people toasting buns and they might do it just for like 10 seconds. I am not on board with this plan because to me that just ends up making your whole burger a little bit too soggy. So I do them low and slow over about four minutes or until I get this nice golden brown effect. And this essentially just gives me one more final texture on my burger to enjoy. Once everything's done, there's only one thing left to do and that's season the tomato and then build our glorious burger. And of course, if you wanna put some pickles or what have you on here, go for it. I'm actually fresh out of pickles. Otherwise, I would've done it. My mouth is like watering. This is, just looks so good. I'm smiling because every component in this burger is thought out. And so after eating a few bites, it's like, how to describe this? It's just not a burger you're ever gonna forget. You're, you're gonna wanna make it again and again and again. Mm.
Nothing wrong with that. Woo! The recipe for this burger will be linked down in the description underneath this video, as well as links to a bunch of my favorite products and equipment that I like to use here on this channel. We also now have merch available for purchase if you want to support the channel. And if you want to keep learning today, I have two more amazing burger videos here. You got Animal Style right here and Crispy Buffalo Chicken right there. Two amazing creations. And until next time, you know I love you in the mouth!